Um, so for those who don't know, I'm Stefan Thiel, I'm the CCO for, for Ethereum. And today what I wanted to talk about was really around the other applications of blockchains. Uh, a lot of people talk about blockchains regarding financial system, decentralized exchanges, that kind of stuff. Uh, but there are other usage, and one I find really interesting is the Internet of Things. So um, I usually finish with that slide, actually, in my presentation. That's my last slide. And I always say, well, you know, what is the future of all this decentralized stuff? And the answer is we don't know. And that's because historically, uh, humanity has done a terrible job at trying to predict the future. Uh, so for example, in the Victorian era in France, in France sorry, um, people thought that the future would be uh, whales <laughs> driving little trams under the sea. And that's, of course, because at the time, they've just made the first discovery of large underwater animals as well as you know the discovery of the tram. I'm not too sure what Peta would think about the uh, little guys uh, in scuba gear poking the well with pointy sticks, but uh, <laughs> thankfully it, it didn't happen. Um, and then you know same thing in the United States in the 50s. You open any type of Pulp Fiction, and what you find is you'll have uh, a flying nuclear car. Why? Because the nuclear bomb, or we see World War II, um, the jets, and um, the explosion of the uh, automobile uh, industry back in the U.S. So we can't predict the future. Uh, but we have choices, and the kind of choices I'm talking about aren't choices relating to you know, which one is the best technology. Is, is Java better than C++? Is, um, say, um, uh, Meteor better than Derby? Now, it's true that Meteor is better than Derby, but <laughs> it's not the kind of choice that really make a big difference um, in the grand scheme of things. And they actually detract us from realizing the importance uh, of the choices that we can make today with, with regards to technology and the impact they can have in 20, 30 years' times. So today, um, the work that you do, if you're a developer, any developers in the room? Raise your hand. Um, yeah, quite a few, actually. Um, the work you do is really important. For the first time in the history of mankind, we're able to communicate with anyone on the planet um, you know, for almost for free. Um, and so the applications that we create will have an impact on a full lot of people because we can communicate with just about anyone on the planet. We can bring information, we can bring wealth, we can even bring freedom uh, to countries who don't enjoy these things. Um, and unfortunately, what I've noticed recently is that a lot of the startups in the Web2 world focus really on monetization first. So monetization is now almost a fetish that has replaced uh, innovation. And when you go see a VC, it's really about how do you acquire eyeballs as fast as humanly possible, and then how do you monetize that stuff? And usually, it's about selling people's private data, isn't it? And that seems to be most of the, uh, of the, of the business model we're seeing on the internet today. And I think that's a shame. Uh, because this technology allows us to do a lot more. So I'll start with a little introduction to loyalty programs, and you'll see what that's relevant in a minute. I used to work in loyalty, so the guy who was selling, uh, you know, sending you coupons in the mail for more shampoo and so on, and that stuff works. I mean, it makes millions, billions of pounds a year for the data analytics company that power them. Um, data analytics companies sit at the middle, really. It's not the products, by the way. It's not the product manufacturers that are trying to send you those annoying coupons or making you use the loyalty cards. It's, it's purely the data analytics company. They, they get a feed from the POS, the TIL system, uh, from large retailers. They analyze the data, put you into little segments in terms of where you are in your life cycles as a customer to those, uh, to those retailers. And then they oversee target you to send you more coupons for shampoo. Uh, and they sell that information back to the product manufacturer. So the product fact manufacturers actually pay for this stuff because they don't understand you, the consumers, but they're not the ones sending you the coupons. It's the retailers trying to increase their sales. And that's important to understand because the data acquisition strategies in the last uh, 10 years have, have radically evolved. So initially, the generation one of uh, data acquisition strategy, it was just really dumb coupons. So you send a coupon in the mail, um, maybe two for one on Coca-Cola or something like that, and you hope that people will go and buy more Coca-Cola. But you don't even know if they drink Coca-Cola in a household. You don't even know how old they are or if they're even relevant. It costs you a fortune, and it's a bit of a, of a blind, blind test, so to speak. Generation two, we introduce store cards. So you get these little store cards in your wallet, you swipe them, they give you your point at till. Why do they do that? Well, because it tells them who you are, how old you are, what you buy, what do you buy stuff with, and from there they can derive really, really interesting, but also very, intr very uh, intrusive stuff about you. For example, in my previous company, we could tell when people were pregnant, uh, and sometimes before people uh, were aware that they were pregnant. Um, so that stuff is starting to get into the uncanny valley territory. Um, 
And then it gets even more creepy, I'm afraid. It's, it's only going to get worse, by the way. Uh, so machine learning and social media. Um, Facebook, for example, doesn't know if you've bought a product because one of your friends recommended it, or do they? Um, what they do is now, they now buy bulk information in the United States as to product purchases in things like Dixon's, for example, and they try to match the name of these people that have been hashed, of course, for your privacy, um, or so they say, um, and they match that, obviously, with their own demographic information about you, since they know how old you are, what's your name, and so on. And from there, they can actually derive, not with 100% accuracy, but with a fairly good, decent amount of accuracy, if you've purchased products based on the influence of your friends or seeing an ad even, just watching it. Um, generation 4, content rewriting. Now that gets really scary. Um, an, an ISP in the United States, it's a big one, AT, ATT, um, is currently making its users pay $29 a month so it wouldn't spy on them by listening to pretty much everything that's on the wire going to their data centers. So when you, I don't know, browse a web page, purchase something on Amazon, watch an ad, they know. And then what they do is they build a profile around you uh, based on what you're looking at, and then they rewrite the ads in the web pages that belong to someone else, of course. And what they're trying to do next is they're going to change the content itself. So Every web page, and that's how they're going to sell it to the people, by the way. They say, it's awesome. It's the ultimate customization. Everybody's watching a different version of a website. Um, and that's exactly what it will be. It will be customized content to your taste, well, allegedly to your taste, uh, done by the ISPs um, in, in complete violation, obviously, of net neutrality. So for Gen 5, we have this, the all-seeing eye of uh, HAL 9000 uh, from 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, we're talking about the Internet of Things, of course, uh, where you per per basically have TV with always on microphones. And the logic here is that you can talk to your television and say volume up, volume down, switch channels, and all that good stuff, but it, the, the mic is always on. And it's listening to pretty much what you're saying in your home. Uh, mobile phones that map your house. Um, Google has a project. You can look it up on Google. It's a phone, has two lenses at the back. You can map your home. They make it look like a game, a bit like what they did with Ingress. And of course, all that data goes to the Google data center. and you know, God knows what happens then. Um, they have glasses now that actually are aware of what you drink. And obviously, the idea is it's faster to go get your, your, your pint at the bar and all that good stuff. But it also tracks everything you drink. It knows who you are, so it knows what you had to drink. It knows what you have going on within your body, pretty much. And that's pretty much what, where all the monetization angle for the quantify self uh, today exists. It's about selling your personal data, as in your health. Is your health good? And all this information is very valuable to insurance companies, for example. So to me, we're going from a, a dramatic overreach in, in terms of commercial and personal privacy, which is all those generations of data analytics we saw earlier, to really what could become the greatest weapon for oppression in the history of mankind, the Internet of Things. Now, thankfully, there's hope. Uh, we have, for example, the IBM Samsung uh, CES Adept demo that took place at the beginning of the year when they were using Ethereum, and they were trying to have a, a, a washing machine uh, being completely autonomous and reordering detergent as needed, um, negotiating with people who sell detergent as part of smart contracts on its very own, um, and the data never obviously leaving the confine of your home where it's safe. And I think that's a very powerful concept because you're really taking data analytics that historically have been done in a data center or usually owned by data analytics company, not even the product manufacturers, um, and they're moving it back onto the edges of the network um, where it's under your control alongside your funds and your personal data. And you can still do all the good stuff that people enjoy with data um, analytics and marketing, that is the, the discounts, of course. You can, for example, know if somebody has children based on how many cycles they run, if they play sport, if, for example, they have the cotton cycle on on Saturdays at a specific time every week. So you can derive all that information, you can even ask them, but it never escapes the home. It never goes to big brother, so to speak. So I think that has a lot of potential. Uh, but there are obstacles. There are obstacles. Uh, so the first one, obviously, is privacy issue. I think people now are really conscious that privacy is a, is a big deal. But for the manufacturers themselves, it's a really big challenge uh, to support products that cost like this light bulb, uh, Belkin, I think it costs like 10 bucks or something like this. Soon it'll cost three bucks. It's a really big challenge to support those products over a period of 10 to 15 years. This light bulb lasts 15 years. Uh, your iPhone costs $1,000 probably, um, and it's okay therefore for Apple to subsidize a iCloud service for three bucks a year. They don't care about this. It's only a small f portion of what they're getting out of the sale of the iPhone. But the guy who sells the, um, 
the three box um, light bulb, he doesn't want to pay three, $3 a year for providing a subsidized service on the cloud. So that's a really big problem for them. So some people have thought, well, that's okay. We'll just do what we always do. We sell people's data. So we'll sell when is the light bulb on, when, where and when are they at home, and so on. But that's not going to work for them, thankfully, by the way. That's not going to work because everything's recording everything you're doing on the Internet of Things. So the TV knows if the lights are on. So you don't need to ask the light bulb. And probably you can even ask the smart meter in your home to know if the lights are on. And it will know, and it can probably sell it to the, to the highest bidder. But basically, you have a market for data that's going to be saturated by people offering personal data. And a any ad revenue, obviously, would be very limited as well because nobody wants to have a big ad projected from their light bulb onto their living room floor. Or at least I hope nobody wants that. Um, the other and final point on this is the high cost of maintaining centralized system. Um, when you, you know, when you have something that lasts, as I said, an iPhone maybe a year, yeah, you can afford a, a big data analytics data center, I'm sure. Or maybe you're the NSA, in which case you can afford it any, regardless. Um, but when you have a product that lasts 20 years, and therefore this will probably be replaced by a new model next year and the following and the next, um, nobody wants to pay for the cost of updating these things, updating the firmware and so on. And that's a problem because if the firmware um, has a bug, for example, and it's something that takes place within your vehicle and you're driving the highway five years after buying the, the vehicle, but nobody wanted to pay for the upgrade that made sure that the brake system wouldn't trigger while you go, say, beyond 100 miles an hour on the freeway, then the people are going to die, literally. Um, so that's a big problem as well, the high cost of maintaining the centralized data centers that nobody wants to, to, to subsidize. And finally, also, there cannot be a single ecosystem. So this idea that we're all going to live in the Google house or the Samsung house that exists only in the heads of the Google and Samsung executives, nobody in the world wants to live in this type of stuff. And the reality is the future probably looks like a, a, a multiple series of ecosystems that are connected to each other um, with interconnectivity as really the key to this, uh, to this puzzle. So putting it all together, um, we have the hardware. That's an SOC from Intel. I think it costs 15 bucks. It has Wi-Fi, it has storage, everything's on board. It's amazing. Um, and for the hardware manufacturers, that means, hey, I don't need to go and build my own uh, piece of kit. I don't need to go call a, fa a fab in China and send them a VHDL model for them to produce it. I can just use an existing chip and I can then update it as well. So if, I'm, if I made a mistake, if my programmers uh, have introduced a bug, they can go and they can fix it after the fact after the release of the hardware. So that's really useful for them as well. What we're missing really is coordination, and of course that's where Ethereum fits in. So the IoT really is about uh, maximum asset utilization. You have an office today, it's open maybe 40%, oh, it's used 40% of the time. It could be open 100% of the time. You could sell access to the office on weekends at a discount price, for example. Um, that's actually, by the way, what Uber does when they raise the, raise the price of, uh, of a ride you know, during the search pricing. Um, they're creating a liquid market for really an economy of, of objects, of vehicles. Um, the idea, by the way, of uh, having a, a car park full of cars during the day and then they're all being used and then they're not used again when they're parked at home, I hope that soon this will become you know, completely absurd to, to people. Um, and we're building marketplaces of microtransactions. So tr microtransaction is not necessarily financial transactions. It can be a doorknob asking permission to do something based on the fact that a smartphone has just been swiped in front of it. Or it could be a Facebook like, or it could be a social media retweet, or something along those lines. It could be a television coordinating with a washing machine, making sure that their total energy, combined energy usage, doesn't go higher than what's available from the solar panel, which is also connected to this to this mesh fabric. So that's the type of transactions we're talking about. And finally, um, I th you know, Vitalik was talking about the Ethereum or th this type of decentralization technology in general as being a way to bring back the modern day utilities like reputation, identity, back into sort of the public domain, if you will. Um, I think this also extends to pretty much the, the actual utilities. So we're looking at blockchain technology, which is about revo revolutionizing communications in order to make society more efficient. And I think what we'll see at first will be hybrid, maybe, a type of solution. So this company called Libellium here. Um, they provide all those sensors, and as you can tell, they're just about anywhere. I think what we'll see is we'll see these guys slowly progressing to hybrid decentralized solutions just to get a leg up on the rest of the market, and then ultimately, potentially, completely decentralized solution. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much.
So we'll do a quick Q&A before Irina, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, we need the microphone, sorry. George will, George will go around with the mic and give it to everyone. Thank you. Are we doing everything with IBM and Samsung? Pardon? Oh, do we have anything to do with it? Uh, so they're using our code base, which I think is a fork of POC5, uh, POC5. And we are providing them with a little bit of advice from time to time, so they're in touch with us. But there is no official partnership. There's a question over there, a gentleman with a blue shirt. Um, um, I was wondering whether you guys are doing anything with particular focus on uh, less economic developed nations such as possibly Southern Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, if there's any kind of market expansion into those areas? So act actively, no. We don't, you know, are not in official talks with either governments or institutions, although that's something we can check maybe with Vinay because he's the uh, specialist in that field. Uh, and uh, <laughs> working on it is, is, it makes total sense. I mean, it's, it's a logical use of the technology. If you look at the meetup maps, though, you'll find that a lot of the meetups are in the developed world already. Um, and I think that's simply because maybe some of the hardcore technology early adopters tend to be more active in those countries. But um, many times we've talked about Ethereum as a technology that had a lot of potential for the developing world, yeah. There is a group of guys uh, in Washington. They're doing a company that you can associate. It's called epoch.io. And they're aiming to do sort of a microfinancing uh, sort of solution for, for uh, less economically developed countries. So if you want to check it out. Mm. Hi, uh, thanks. Really enjoyed that. Um, how do we know that the chip that you show is that we can build up the Internet of Things on top of doesn't have like an NSA backdoor? Now, well, unfortunately, we can't know that. But then again, that's also true for the laptop that's within your, uh, your well, yeah, any, any chip that's inside any laptop. I think uh, it's safe to assume that everything's been infiltrated. Now, the question is, what can, acti can they actually do? And I think it's, you know, at the moment, it will be limited to things like rebooting remotely when they want to trigger some specific attack or something along those lines, they. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, but not necessarily, you know, decrypting stuff that's already been encrypted. So if you're using... I don't know, RSA encryption. I was just recreating some, some PGP key this afternoon, you know, 4,096-bit uh, key. Um, I think that's still pretty safe, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that will be a, a big question. And I would like to see, you know, the development we do at, at Ethereum, and in fact, everybody in the field is very much open source, right? And I'd like to see everything to be extended to open source, including the hardware. So any effort along those lines, if you guys know about it, I'd love to hear. Thank you. Yep. Oh, hi, Chris. Presumably the Internet of Things is going to be made up of many low-powered devices all over the place, and they'll need quite efficient and low-powered software clients. Do you know anybody who's writing software for those kind of low-powered devices now? Um, well, it starts with removing the requirement for mining, um, so obviously light nodes. And then it extends to having smaller requirement for storage, so that goes into light clients, as in uh, well, e Ethereum light clients, or just like we have Bitcoin light clients, as in single payment verification clients. Um, and then it's about getting completely rid of mining, uh, like proof of stake, for example. Uh, in terms of who's actively actively writing stuff along those lines, I'm not aware of any projects, but I'm aware of POS projects. <coughs> yep. Oh, sorry, Josh. I keep forgetting we need the mic. Hello. Hello. Um, so you said with, uh, <coughs> with the washing machine, for example, yep. uh, there's some program that acts on uh, ordering things and uh, negotiating deals right. and stuff. So it basically right. acts as an agent. Yeah, uh, yeah it, we're going so back to the days so of the managers, agent yeah. is it and what its motivation. Well, that's the beauty of it, right? It's its own agent. Um, and I quite like this idea of having those autonomous, uh, what, what we call DAOs in, in the world of Ethereum, uh, being able to take economical action as part of a, a sort of an optimum economy. Um, now, the risk, obviously, of these technologies, if I'm trying to read between the lines of your question, the risk is obviously that the people who manufacture the, the dishwashers will integrate agents that are biased towards certain maybe detergent manufacturers or maybe towards themselves. Um, that's the risk. But by you know, maybe using a reputation system and having all this stuff open state, just like it is on Ethereum, I think there's a chance for people to say, hey, you know what, they claim to be open, but it's actually a little bit proprietary. So we rely on the community. I think it's a bit, um, so uh, to negotiate a deal, you mm -hmm. need to have a goal, a motivation. 
So how would you assign ah. the motivation to, 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 to the program? All right. Oh, well, that's, that's the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the easy, it's the easy part because there is, it's a smart contract that says when you have run out of uh, dishwashing liquid, which probably will have to be entered by a human at first, I've just bought one liter of X and I want more, then obviously from there the machine calculates how much detergent was, was consumed and as, it's, as it over time uh, calculates an average use, then it's able to make decisions around should I buy bulk or should I not buy bulk and who should I buy from, uh, you know, what's the co lowest cost of delivery based on X, Y, Z. We can do that today with centralized technology using APIs. I mean, if, if you look at what Amazon is doing with the, um, what's it called, the dash button, something along those lines, um, you press the button on your dishwasher and it orders uh, more dishwasher detergent liquid. Um, the problem with that obviously is there's a logo on that uh, <laughs> little uh, device and it's always the same logo and also is always Amazon so you can see where the, the motivation lies there. Yeah? Is the first time I've heard of the internet of the internet of things being representative or presented as a way of um, keeping the data private because Today, it seems very much that uh, data is a commodity. You know, if we're not selling, if we're not paying for the service, then uh, we are the, the product, as, yeah. as they say. So, um, do you think uh, I'm very interested in how you think this uh, that this can be changed in a in, a, in an Internet of Thing model where the precedent seems to be very much the opposite? Yeah, I'd, I'm not a fan of the idea that you need some sort of horrible even to then trigger a revolution and people will rebel and not purchase centralized products anymore. I think if you require that, you might have to wait a long time indeed. Um, and also, um, when you look at, for example, the fact that today anybody below 20 years old has never seen a world without the internet, what's offensive to us isn't at all offensive to them. So they're, they're perfectly comfortable giving their personal data. And in fact, if you were to ask them, I'm sure they probably would say they don't really care, especially the younger generation, uh, as to what happens to that data as long as they get to play the funny game or <laughs> something like that. Um, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't uh, a place for niche system at the very beginning to be implemented and maybe some positive stories to come out of this, just like there were some positive stories coming out of the internet at the beginning and then people being inspired from. So I think it's gonna grow very incrementally uh, from niche project and, and certain verticals and then people will be inspired by it and start piggybacking. Um, from a less altruistic perspective, you could imagine a company that offers a partially decentralized service where you can verify they're not fudging the numbers by looking at the blockchain, and another that doesn't, and me as a consumer, I get a choice. Um, I'll always go for the one that provides more transparency, and hopefully that will force uh, the market to go towards more open technologies. Thanks, and, and do you feel that the ADEPT program is signaling that kind of um, <coughs> move away from the value of the personal data or the usage? Yeah, absolutely, and, and, but not for the reason you think. It's, um, so when I talked to uh, the chaps that were involved with the project at the very beginning, um, they said it was a really big concern to them. Um, first of all, the way people reacted in terms of uh, their privacy concerns and platforms. So monetizing platforms for them, that was already a big no-no, so that's why they started on this project. And the second thing, it's businesses that they were really concerned about because when the Snowden revelation uh, were, were revealed, um, you ended up with a lot of UK and Canadian businesses leaving the United States, you know, in terms of cloud solutions, uh, leaving those cloud solutions and preferring providers that were elsewhere. And obviously that cost quite a bit of money to uh, to centralized platform providers, obviously, but in the, particularly in the United States. Um, so I think they're conscious of this and they're trying to find solutions that where well, they can still make their money, right? They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart, uh, but they're trying to, to, to well, yeah, to find a, a good uh, resolution between privacy and making money. And I can see that Alessandro is telling me to hurry up. The light. There you go. Um, <laughs> Speaking of uh, removing the need for mining, uh, what are your thoughts on Stella? On Stella? Yeah. Well, it's not a blockchain, is it? So it's a bit of a non-starter. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, it's, it's obviously, yeah, you remove the need for mining if you remove the blockchain. But then again, if you remove the need for consensus, then what value does it have? I mean, I'm interested in blockchains because in the context of Bitcoin, for example, you have $6 billion of value on a network that's on the internet, which might as well be the digital Vietnam War. Um, and that, uh, that, net, that code is also completely open source. So they've managed to, ex to achieve security on $6 billion of value. And God knows on the internet, people are going to try to steal that money, right? Um, by exposing their code to the world to see. I think that's where the real value is. When you start slapping that stuff behind a VPN, calling it a private chain, it presents a lot less value to me, at least as I understand it today. OK? Any other questions? One last question, and then we'll let Irina present. This might, uh, this might lead on to Adam's talk, but um, a lot of activities are currently regulated. Mm -hmm. um, Providing the taxi service was appears to be regulated in lots of places. I mean, how, how do you envisage Ethereum and the services that would, would would appear with Ethereum dealing with regulation? Um, doesn't doesn't seem to fit into the sort of current frame. Mm -hmm. That's a big question. Um, well, this. In multiple ways. So the first one is the systems that are developed on Ethereum aren't necessarily illegal or going against uh, regulatory authorities. For example, consumer protection can be written into an Ethereum contract. That contract will probably cost more money than the one that doesn't co have consumer protection. But at least now you get the choice. And I think choice is good, so I personally support that sort of thing. Um, and then in terms of uh, how realistic is it to see it implemented at mass scale, um, I think Uber is a good example of this. Um, I was actually in a, in a cab on my way uh, to, to Paris as a French cab driver, and he was telling me how he was fantasizing about putting a bullet in an Uber driver's head uh, because these guys, <laughs> these guys were stealing his job, and you know, uh, you know, like typical French fashion, fashion, it would be like revolution very soon, and they're going to go and smash all the Uber drivers. Um, and they were actually, the, the irony was that he was, he was upset at the president because the, pr the president wasn't protecting him. Um, so you have this sort of trying to go back to protectionism, uh, which obviously is we know from experience is going to go absolutely nowhere, um, when in fact he could have just embraced this technology and say, well, you know, I could also operate in a, under an Uber model. And in the context of something like Ethereum, it will be more like a co-op rather than platform capitalism. So I think there's, there's, there's definitely potential for this kind of projects to, 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 do, uh, to achieve mass, mass adoption. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and now we'll have uh, Irina telling us...